I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to the education program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, and institutions involved in the world of higher education. Today we'll be talking about deaf education. Dr. Julie Michener is an education professor at Gallaudet University who specializes in family-centered early education. Before becoming a faculty member at Gallaudet, Julie attended Gallaudet and was a teacher at the Laurent Clare National Deaf Center. Julie earned her PhD from George Mason University. Before we begin, let me introduce to you Amanda Egger and Ellen Schein, two interpreters from Gallaudet Interpreting Service. Welcome. Julie, maybe if we can start with Gallaudet University. What okay. does Gallaudet University do? How long has Gallaudet University been around? And, and maybe if you could say a word or two about the department that you teach in at Gallaudet. I think that would be helpful. Sure, I'd be glad to. So Gallaudet University is a bilingual, multicultural, liberal, liberal arts institution that uh, promotes the academic advancement of uh, deaf and hard of hearing people. We are a leader in research, education, audiology, linguistics, deaf studies, uh, deaf culture, and many other um, disciplines. We have about 1,800 students, all the way from undergrads to the doctoral level. And 67% of those students are deaf from uh, various backgrounds. Uh, we also welcome hearing students into the university. Some programs do require those students to uh, take a proficiency exam because Gallaudet University, like I said, is a bilingual institution, so we use American Sign Language and English. It is a very unique place. Deaf people uh, come to Gallaudet and feel at home. So I work in the teacher preparation program in the deaf education department. So we prepare uh, all the way from early education, secondary, to uh, deaf education and higher ed. Well, let's assume that I wanted to learn more about deaf culture. And I'm hearing, but let's assume I wanted to learn more de about deaf culture. What courses would I take at Gallaudet University? Well, Gallaudet University offers a wide range of courses, all the way from uh, American Sign Language 101, just learning how to communicate at a basic level, all the way to advanced. Uh, and you can take courses in deaf culture, deaf history, deaf education, and so forth. You can also study the linguistics of American Sign Language and see how it's developed, and look at that in conjunction with other languages. Um, so you can really take a variety of courses from different disciplines. When you mentioned other languages, uh, as many viewers of this show know, uh, we've done a lot of programming in South Africa. And one of the big controversies in South Africa centers around the use of language and that a number of students in South Africa uh, end up studying in their third and fourth languages. So what's not their native tongue they're studying in, 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 an, in a subject, they might be studying a very difficult subject, but they're studying it in a language that perhaps they learned uh, many years after they were born. How would that work in terms of somebody studying ASL at some point later in their lives? So there has been a lot of research that shows that deaf children benefit from having access to American Sign Language as well as English. So the bilingual approach is very important. And biologically we see that the brain can acquire multiple languages at once. So American Sign Language is a full bona fide language, it is fully accessible to deaf children. And if they do have that early access, access to language, that early exposure, then they will have the foundation for learning a second language. Unfortunately, oftentimes deaf children, uh, when they are born, the medical professions make the suggestion that 
Uh, they hold off on the visual language and focus on the spoken language first and use the sign language as a last resort. Um, so that's unfortunate and then those um, students or children are deprived of a visual language and once they are exposed are far behind their peers. So it's very important to uh, develop that first language so that they have that foundation. So the visual language is a huge benefit um, to deaf children and they then are able to um, acquire second and third languages. So we use the bilingual approach in, and deaf education uses multiple approaches um, from the oral method only all the way to uh, various communication approaches to the uh, bilingual approach which uses American Sign Language in English. So our teacher prep program emphasizes uh, the bilingual approach, like I said, and we talk about how to use um, that educational approach as a bridge between American Sign Language and English so that our students can succeed. Now, I realize that you're here representing Gallaudet, but let's assume that I lived in the middle of Indiana and I didn't have access to Gallaudet University. What would I do in terms of my educational background? Sure. So deaf education in America is actually ahead of uh, deaf education in other countries. So there is quite a bit of a lack of misunderstanding about deaf children and how they are raised how they need to be educated, but now with technology, we're able to reach out to other uh, communities, so rural communities, as well as other countries. So each country, of course, has its own sign language, and we would not um, use American Sign Language with them. We value their own language, and we would recognize uh, their sign language of their country. So that would be the medium for teaching uh, deaf children in another country. But what about a student in the United States who is hard of hearing and perhaps they had that conversation with the doctor that you referenced a moment ago? How do you make sure that they don't struggle in school if, on one hand, Dr. Jones or Dr. Smith is saying, you know, I want you to focus on uh, the spoken language not necessarily the visual language, but meanwhile the student is falling farther and farther behind in school, what is that student supposed to do? Right, well, fortunately now we have a lot more research uh, that can support uh, early access to language, um, as well as spoken language. Many people think that sign language will interfere with the spoken language development, but we have biological evidence that the brain uh, is plastic, you know, has plasticity and is able to acquire uh, those two languages. So uh, we have uh, educational partnerships with families. We invite role models from the deaf community to come in and uh, mentor. So those who have cultural competence and cultural knowledge and have grown up with the culture and the language can um, mentor those in how to become more visually uh, adept and to uh, acquire the visual language. Well, who are some of the role models that are part of the deaf community and the deaf culture right now? Uh, we have a variety of people, so uh, some deaf parents who may be raising deaf children who have a lot of experience in how to raise a deaf child in a visual environment. They are wonderful role models, so in terms of communication, and not only that, but uh, cultural identity and really uh, encouraging a positive view and identity of themselves, uh, as well as knowledge of the community. Then also researchers who are knowledgeable about education in general, deaf education, language and so forth. Um, so they ensure that the children get high quality of education as well as peers. So peers learn from one another. They also learn from other deaf adults. 
So deaf children who are raised in a monolingual environment with only spoken English, who've never met other deaf people, oftentimes have misconceptions uh, of themselves that maybe they'll become hearing one day. And once they meet another deaf person, they realize that they're not alone in the world, there are other people like themselves, and it's very important to have role models who are a part of their lives. And um, deaf gain is uh, a concept that we use. Oftentimes people have the pejorative view of deaf people, uh, that they cannot function, that um, they aren't able to do certain things, and that just isn't the case. And the deaf community really has, uh, has contributed to the wider world. So we call this deaf gain. So um, with language research, we understand more about uh, language in general. So there was research on spoken language. Now there's research on sign languages, which has shed light on those spoken languages. Also now we have uh, closed captioning, which is now accessible to the world in general. And so the, the general world has learned a lot from the deaf community. Can you say a word or two about Helen Keller and Alexander Graham Bell? As I was getting ready for the segment, I kept reading over and over and over again about their influences in, to the deaf community. So Helen Keller was deaf and blind, and she was uh, somebody who really overcame the barriers that came her way. She was very successful. She learned sign language as well as spoken English and really overcame a lot of barriers. So she is a great role model for the deaf blind community, and we do have many more deaf blind students now enrolling at the university level. They are um, our peers. They are part of the community um, fully. Now, Alexander Graham Bell, um, really, there's so much to tell, but he was uh, focused on um, oral education, and he was a eugenics, in support of eugenics, so he really wanted to eradicate deaf people from the earth, and he didn't want to see uh, sign language being used because he believed that that interfered with the development of spoken English. So I'll leave it at that. Fair enough. In terms of sports figures, are there sports figures that some people could look to uh, as, as kind of role models in the deaf community? I have to admit that I don't know a lot about sports. I am very proud to say that one of our Gallaudet football players is now uh, considered or considering going into the NFL. I know that they're uh, right now going through recruiting and so forth, and he's a wonderful athlete. I also know that Curtis Pride, our baseball coach, uh, was a pro baseball player, but uh, don't know a lot else. We also have the Deaf Olympics. So in conjunction with the uh, Hearing Olympics, we have the Deaf Olympics that happens every four years. Deaf people from around the world come together to compete with one another. We have both um, uh, winter and summer Olympics, so I have a lot happening in that realm. If you don't mind me asking a little bit more about your personal life, uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about the hearing and non-hearing relationships that exist within your family, if that's not a too personal a question? No, not at all. So I, myself, come from a deaf family, so both of my parents are deaf. I have siblings who are also deaf, although I have one sister who is hearing. And my husband is also deaf, who also comes from a deaf family. And it is oftentimes that you see uh, fully deaf families because it is sometimes genetic. I have two hearing daughters who are fully bilingual in American Sign Language and spoken English, and they are also bicultural. And, uh, we are a family. Any family, to be successful, needs to share a language, to be able to communicate with one another, and uh, to share a culture. If there are language barriers, it's always a challenge to uh, those relationships. Now, 90% of deaf children actually come from hearing families, so it is a challenge uh, for those families. And 
there's been research on deaf families to see how they interact with their deaf children. So we have learned a lot from those families in terms of uh, visual acuity and attention getting, and we have applied those strategies to the classroom to make sure that communication is fully accessible with those students. You mentioned bicultural. Could you say a word or two about the two cultures that exist in your family, but also the two cultures that you're referring to? Sure, so in the deaf community, we say the deaf world and the hearing world. So those are the two ends of the uh, spectrum. So the larger society we call the hearing world, and it is uh, where we are obviously involved on a daily basis. And then we also have what we call the deaf world, where we share the same experiences, values, language, and so forth. And it's very important for deaf children to experience both and to be able to um, have knowledge of both. So we have hearing children who have deaf parents, we call them CODAs, and they um, need to develop their own sense of identity so that they know that they are part of both worlds. They are part of the hearing world as well as the deaf world so that they can have a healthy self-esteem. So my two girls know that they are part of both communities and both worlds and they are able to function in both environments. And it is really a strength and it's a, a positive thing for them. They have two languages and two cultures, so we see that very much as a benefit for them. Well, in terms of the cultures, uh, one of the ways that this segment came about is I met somebody at a lunch who was telling me about deaf culture a little bit more than I knew, and she was explaining that, uh, that Deaf people will often joke that hearing people are a lot less expressive when they communicate. And I hadn't really thought much about that. And as we're even having this discussion today, I'm speaking the way I normally speak, and I'm assuming you're speaking the way that you normally speak, and you're more expressive. Can you explain a little bit more about the roots of that? Sure, I'd be glad to. So sign language actually involves the full body, so uh, facial expressions uh, as well as use of hands, so non-manual markers, non-manual grammar, and the um, manual grammar. So phonology, morphology, um, semantics, and everything is present uh, in American Sign Language just as it is in all other languages, including English. So American Sign Language is not a form of English. It is uh, of equal status to English, just a completely different language. And so um, we value American Sign Language as a resource and those who uh, have, uh, and, and really American Sign Language is the right of all deaf children to acquire. So, a positive view of deaf person and positive identity is very important for deaf children to develop. Well, and in terms of identity, one of the struggles that I know that the deaf community has is around the definition of disability and whether or not a deaf child is disabled or not. And I know that that is a negative term in many places, but my understanding is that the Department of Education has a definition that's perhaps a little bit different than what the deaf community has. Maybe if you wouldn't mind saying a word or two about that. Sure. So the deaf community sees ourselves as a language and cultural minority rather than a disability or a disabled uh, community. We are fully abled. Uh, we uh, don't have any deficits. We have, can think. Uh, critically uh, live and thrive just as uh, other folks. So I if you don't mind actually asking your question again, specifically, what are you asking? Uh, I'm asking the, the definition, not what the disability, not, not the issue of a disability from the perspective of somebody who's deaf, but from the definition of the government. So the US government and the education department have a number of definitions about ways to get grants, uh, who qualifies for certain monies, 
for different programs. And one of the things that I kept noticing as I was preparing for today was that there's not necessarily agreement, if I understood this correctly, between what a government definition of disability is and what the deaf community's definition is. Right. Thank you for bringing that uh, issue up. So, like I said, we do not consider ourselves disabled, but in order to get services, for example, interpreters or to access certain information, we do need to declare ourselves as disabled. And we believe that the term disabled is actually a social construct. It's not about something that we can't do. It's more about what uh, or how society views us, and they label us disabled. Um, we see, we do not see it from that pejorative perspective. We see it as uh, people who have the full ability to succeed and um, be full participants in society. Fair enough. Could you say a word or two about other educational institutions that a student would go to? Let's assume they can't get to Gallaudet. Are there other, I think one of the schools I noticed that had a big program was up in Rochester. Uh, are there, I assume there are other places that one could go besides Rochester and Gallaudet. Before I mention those other colleges, I would like to talk a bit about K through 12, so uh, infant through high school and so forth. So uh, like I said, there's a range of approaches from the oral approach to the bilingual approach and many in between. Deaf education is really about how to best educate deaf children. And deaf children as individuals vary greatly. So uh, their family background, their hearing level, their educational experience, um, so vary tremendously. So there is no one size fits all. And it's um, important to look at the individual. So we have different settings. We have a mainstream setting where a deaf child may be in a hearing classroom, maybe with some support um, like interpreters Sometimes we have a CART system, which is a captioning system, uh, real-time captioning. So anything that is spoken in the classroom will be shown on the text. Then sometimes note takers can be provided and uh, other types of accommodations. There are also fully deaf schools, which provide direct communication between peers, uh, from the teachers to the students, and so forth. So most schools, of, for the deaf use the bilingual approach and support the use of both American Sign Language and English and that direct instruction. And the content of those instructions are equal to any other school. And the only difference is the teaching approach and the pedagogy. And let's assume that a student made it through high school. Where would they go? This is a show about higher education. Uh, so where would some students go to continue their education? Right, so we do have Gallaudet University, which we hope uh, many others will come to. Uh, and then there are other programs as well. So there's programs around the United States. Uh, there is Rochester, the National Technological Institute for the Deaf, NTID. We have CSUN, which is the California... California State University in Northridge, and other programs. So deaf students can go to those programs or any other university around the United States. I think that um, it's very important that wherever they go, they are given fully access, or given full access and accommodated in any way they need. So uh, that they're provided with interpreters or any other way that their uh, environment can be made visual for them. So I can just give you uh, one example uh, of making sure that the environment is visually accessible. So changing the seating arrangement to make, put everybody in either a U shape or a circle would make it much more accessible so that they could see everyone in the class rather than in rows. And then also for the professor to show a PowerPoint and pause for a moment so that the student can read the PowerPoint and then see what's being said. And any times there, anytime there's a discussion in a seminar or so forth, of course, the interpreters are a few seconds behind. And it's important to make sure that uh, turn-taking is 
is uh, paid attention to so that, so that the deaf person can be involved equally. So we cannot assume that every one size fits all. We need to make sure that we um, fit the needs of each individual. Well, fair enough. We only have another minute or two left. Is there anything that you would like to add that perhaps I forgot to ask you? Actually, I would like to talk a little bit about technology. Technology has uh, improved greatly in the past number of years and has really um, made the information, the share of information, so much easier for deaf people. So deaf people can now uh, be in touch with more people around the globe, um, th whether that's through the video relay service, where we have an operator um, facilitating the communication, interpreting to the hearing uh, person on the other end. And then we also have video conferencing, where we can use American Sign Language with whoever is on the other end. And uh, we have now smart boards and other visual technology, um, a document reader. So now uh, we have access to all this technology so that students can see the English text as well as the American Sign Language and that supports the bilingual approach. So we have seen unfortunately more and more courses that are online um, have videos but not have closed captioning. So that is one area that we need to see improved, but it is a great benefit to have the videos. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, it's been my pleasure. If you would like additional information about Dr. Dooley Mitchner, please visit galudet.edu. If you have comments or suggestions about higher education today, please send an email to our viewer mailbox at highereducationtoday at topcolleges.com. Thank you for watching. We will continue to bring you quality discussions about important matters in today's college and university world. Please join me again for another edition of Higher Education Today. I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, and you've been watching Higher Education Today.